welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and believe me, I am so honored um, uh, to have somebody that I've, I've looked up to for years, uh, many, many years, to watch him operate and, and, and practice right here, stable for years in the city of New Orleans. So many of you know him, and, and he has uh, so many patients, but we have uh, the, the, the president of the New Orleans Medical Association. Uh, he's a family practitioner right here in the city of New Orleans, Dr. Henry Evans. Welcome, Doc. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for such kind words. Oh, no. Glad to be here. Well, hey, no, we're honored to have you more than anything. Uh, before we even get started, tell us a little bit about yourself and your career and, and kind of how do you got in this position. I've, been, I've had the privilege of uh, serving the New Orleans community now for approximately almost 40 years. Wow. Uh, we started off in the uptown area uh, on Louisiana Avenue right. uh, and continued at that particular location until Hurricane Katrina. Uh, since Katrina, we're now located in the Gentilly uh, area at 4301 Elysian Fields. Um, and of course, uh, in my role as a family practitioner, mm -hmm. I have the opportunity to serve uh, all the segments of the population. Right. We like to think that the uh, family practitioner serves the family. Right. That is to say, starting from the infants and the newborns, extending uh, up to the geriatric group. Right. So it's really been uh, a privilege and a pleasure to, uh, to have that, uh, to be able to serve this community for so many years. Great, great, great. Uh, now, are you from New Orleans, Dr. Evans? Yes, I am. Uh, as we said, locally, uh, born at Flint Griffiths Hospital. Really? Me too. <laughs> which, is, uh, which is an honor within and of itself. That's right. But having gone through the uh, New Orleans public school system, a graduate of Joseph S. Clark High School. Wow, great. Uh, attended uh, Dillard University. Wow. Uh, and subsequently on to uh, Howard University. And coming back to do my uh, further medical training, uh, at, uh, at LSU, with the LSU School of, of Medicine, and as well as with Tulane at Charity Hospital. Fan. Can't get too more local. Th that's that. local. <laughs> Look, Rouses doesn't think about local. That's right. This is obviously local, in that, and I think it's an inspiration to uh, all of the um, uh, Joseph S. Clark, I think it was the Bulldogs over at Clark. That's it. The Blue Devils over at Dillard. Yes. And uh, LSU and Tulane all the way. Yeah, just local that's fantastic um, yeah you work hard you get what you need to get yeah but medicine is certainly uh, as pharmacy is uh, an intensive uh, undertaking uh, it certainly is a very absorbing commitment right. uh, and, but I, I feel good because I think that uh, we look at our school system our public school system and we think that we, we tend to look down upon it but I'm happy to say I think that that the school prepared me well, and it's prepared me for subsequent secondary education, uh, for professional education, uh, and ultimately to be the physician that I am. Uh, it, 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 exciting, and, and believe me, I, you know, I've, I've been filling his prescriptions for years. I've, been, I've he's 40 years. I'm 30 years in. So ever since when I first got out of school, you know, the the uh, can you is there a number of the amount of patients you've seen over the 40 years? Any idea? Totally. You know, it was very ironic. Uh, initially, I worked at the Neighborhood Health Clinic uh, back in 1972 to 73, and I opened my office up in 1974. And from day one uh, in 1974, when we opened our office, we had a full uh, office. Uh, we had about 30 patients. And I would say that since then, uh, generally speaking, we have not had less than 30 patients a day. And again, I think it owes to the fact that Having come from New Orleans and having uh, been known in the community, I think that the community had uh, took some pride in the fact that I was local, That's uh, that I was one of them, right. and I really feel honored uh, and humbled uh, by that particular fact. So, in the general, generally speaking, we see between in my office at this present time sees between 30 and 60 patients a day. Fantastic, and they love you. Um, they love you. Uh, when we think think about it, you know, within the community, the physician in the community is still a, a, a literally an honored uh, position and, uh, uh, hey, I would say I've upheld it um, uh, spotlessly, you know, over 40 years that uh, the community can be proud and see what, what's going on. Tell us a little bit about the New Orleans Medical Association. 
uh, unknown <coughs> to many. Yes, the New Orleans Medical Association uh, is an organization uh, just about 40 years old. Uh, and uh, it was born out of a different time. As you know, uh, uh, this community and many and communities across the country uh, were segregated. Uh, and they were, the, the black doctors were uh, kind of in a, in a uh, area in, up into the themselves. And they, they had peculiar problems that, that only black physicians would, uh, would deal with. Uh, and as, uh, in terms of ongoing medical education, or in terms of advocacy, uh, in terms of talking about common problems, um, not to the point of being ex of excluding anyone, mm -hmm. and that's something that's in our creed, not mm -hmm. on a, an exclusionary basis, mm -hmm. but understanding that there was a need, a peculiar and particular need to address uh, the problems of the community that we serve. And we talk about the community being both the professional community, uh, the physicians, as well as our patients. Uh, so we've been uh, in existence now for over seven, approximately 70 years. Now, of course, this is a different time. That's correct. Uh, hospital staffs have been uh, integrated mm -hmm. uh, and diversified uh, This, uh, in terms of uh, physicians having come through the system, like myself, right. uh, Charity Hospital uh, with uh, LSU and Tulane. Uh, the system is certainly a lot, vastly different. However, there are problems now that are still peculiar uh, to the minority community. As you know, we are adversely affected by a number of entities. For instance, diabetes, right. hypertension, um, violence, uh, things that happen with respect to infants, uh, low uh, infant, high infant mortality. So there still are, are, are problems which are peculiar to, to our community, uh, the, the so-called disparities that exist. Uh, we feel that there's still a need for this organization. In addition to that, we tend to advocate on behalf of both the patients as well as the physicians. Right. Uh, for instance, uh, right now with the Accountable Care Act, Okay. We feel that uh, that is tr truly our obligation uh, mm -hmm. to uh, try to particularly address the issues related to uh, the Accountable Care Act and how it will have an impact upon our community and the physicians who serve the community. That's a responsibility. Yes. That's a responsibility. Agree, agree, agree. Uh, literally, because what, what, what happens uh, at the national level obviously affects um, the, the patient, because every, the key is being patient focused and uh, thinking about them. I, I'll just use something that we talked about even a few weeks ago. If it was all little green people that had problems, all right, then the whole country should focus on these little green people. If it was all yellow people, then we should focus on that. If it just happens to be African Americans uh, that obviously through the statistics are disproportionately affected, it, it's almost insane to not focus on it or better yet take the people who are of that particular group to focus on it uh, specifically. It's almost nutty to not even have a, an association to focus. I think, I think that uh, that's, that's well said. Uh, <clears throat> and certainly, uh, for instance, one of the things that we did this past year uh, that you're very well, very familiar with, as you know, the uh, Medicaid uh, system was uh, taken over by uh, five private companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the Medicaid system now is vastly different than it was a year, a year and a half ago. True. Uh, so that one of the focus of our organization was to inform the physicians about the uh, oncoming changes that would take place. Okay. Uh, we met with the various companies in advance. We talked with them. Uh, they presented their plans and their programs so that, that our physicians were very familiar with that. And as a result, when the program was implemented, when it went into effect, I think that we had we were far ahead of the curve. Good. And we were, we were able to uh, deal with the, with, the, with the various changes, the, the bureaucratic aspects of it, the financial aspect of it, and the patient management ca uh, uh, aspect of it. So, the, you know, it's, it's a very basic thing, but generally speaking, organizations don't focus in on these particular issues. But we knew that this would peculiarly uh, and emphatically affect our community, 
and we wanted to be on top of it. Uh, so that uh, in terms of information, in terms of education of the physician, uh, and also in terms of advocacy on behalf of patients. For instance, if we know that there are changes that are going to come out of Baton Rouge, that we don't feel it's in the best interest of our patients, we don't mind standing up and going up to Baton Rouge uh, and, and speaking before the legislature and advocating on behalf of our patients, our patients as well as the medical society and medical community in general. So that's what this organization is all about. Uh, I think that, it, that certainly there's a need for that. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? What, makes, what really comes to mind, just last night, they had the hullabaloo over um, Cortez Hankton, the police officer who didn't intervene in a big fight on Canal Street. And I happened to watch this video and watch these two girls fighting and, and the boy beating the girl and about the police officer not doing this. We have a problem. I look at the, the, the physicians, uh, and I always we, we talk about the social workers, their job, but with proper medical care, taking care of these kids from a young age, we can deal with a lot of them. These are medical issues that, that can be dealt with. If we see psychosocial problems, mental health problems, if they're regularly seeing a physician. So when decisions are made in Baton Rouge that disproportionately affect the poor, in a community, uh, you're almost creating this type of uh, situation. It, uh, if, if people with private insurance are getting better medical care than those who are in these state programs, we're paving the way for uh, destruction. You're quite, quite correct. And, and I can see uh, where uh, down the line, the, the impact that we make as physicians could make a difference in the outcome uh, in that particular situation. For instance, uh, we see the kids in our office uh, at an early age uh, in terms of growth and development. Uh, they, we, we have to be the shepherds of that particular situation to be sure that the parents understand about the nutritional needs, be sure that we properly assess those children to be sure that they are appropriate uh, for their age as they enter into uh, school, elementary, secondary school, to identify problems, whatever they may be, or behavioral problems, uh, needs that have to be addressed from a medical perspective, uh, obesity problems uh, that have to be addressed, sort of medical issues from a, from a medical point of view, then the physician has to intervene and to be available to that. And of course, as adults, uh, in terms of uh, managing stress, uh, in terms of conflict resolution, uh, in terms of being sure that individuals are healthy, hypertension, diabetes, all of these things affect the total milieu, uh, affect the totality uh, and the total well-being of what, those, uh, what the community is all about. So very definitely across the board, patients need good medical care and even a fairly routine kind of incident that you alluded to, there's a lot of medical medicine and medical intervention which needs to be interplayed across the board. That's right, just a, a family practitioner, local practitioners that are there to serve as the gatekeeper to say, hey, let's bring in the social workers. Let's, hey, we need social workers here. Bring in the psychiatrists. Hey, let's look at uh, you know, other issues uh, um, uh, that may be happening in, in, in the family. Right, we like to consider ourselves as family practitioners as being the, the gatekeepers of medicine. That's right. uh, I would think also we're like the officials who are in the game, the game of life, <clears throat> uh, or the umpire, mm -hmm. uh, so that sometimes we have to call a timeout. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we have to give a penalty mm -hmm. uh, for a patient right. uh, for an infraction that they make, so that we are essentially the gatekeepers or the umpires or the officials over a patient's health. Uh, that, and, and I think that society needs to understand that, that uh, particularly when we speak about uh, New Orleans being the worst in the world, the country at least, um, you know, in education, violence, uh, literally every statistic known to man. So therefore, the weight of uh, what's happening, they need to speak to the family practitioners. Uh, to me, that should be the, the primary when we speak about first offenders, first uh, 
uh, responders or whatever. Uh, that conversation needs to be had. Now, again, we're dealing with a lot of cash, a lot of money. We're, it's not actual cash, but there's a lot of um, uh, uh, money, private money, public money, tax dollars that are going on. So, um, uh, my understanding is that uh, the pressures, we had uh, Secretary Greenstein was here before he left, um, and he promised that the monies that was going to the poor, when this plan was first set up, he promised that it would, it would benefit those who are on a lower uh, income spectrum, uh, and it would not negatively affect the physicians, pharmacists, or whatever. I can say it has negatively affected pharmacy, so I, I'll, I'll speak for that right away. And well, that's, that's a very powerful subject, uh, and, and certainly I can appreciate uh, the uh, statement that Mr. Greenspan made prior to his, uh, his uh, leaving the office. And uh, when, when the community was presented with these uh, plans uh, over a year and a half ago, uh, it certainly did sound good that they were going to bring in five new companies who would be uh, responsible for the management of the Medicaid program. However, uh, in point of fact, uh, what I have seen, again, is what you mentioned is a cutback in medical services. For instance, uh, one way in which we get a cutback in medical services is that there's a, a very uh, unwieldy process by which uh, certain um, products or certain services are authorized. Uh, we have to make telephone calls, and sometimes we get an answering machine. Uh, very seldom we get a live person, or if we do get a live person, uh, they will tell us that they will call us back. Uh, sometimes it takes five, six, seven times uh, before we get an actual response. Now, what, the, what does this do? It ties up the personnel. Uh, it, it, um, it, it costs a, a lot of time in terms that takes away from uh, patient care, uh, and you end up with no results. That's a simple-minded kind of thing. Right. The other thing that happens is that uh, various services that were, for instance, medication right. that were available uh, to the patient uh, prior to the implementation of this program are no longer available. That's correct. Uh, and patients now quite often are dealing with less effective medications. Medications, for instance, in mental health. That's correct. Which is very critical. Uh, when you make cha subtle changes against patients who have previously been stabilized on a particular medical regimen, it can make all the difference in the world insofar as their stability is concerned. That's right. So these are the kinds of things uh, that I see that have taken place. Again, a lot of services have been provided, but I personally I have not seen it. And, and I think that from my point of view, this whole uh, change has been uh, has been a disaster. Now, we in the medical community, for instance, as well as medical association, uh, we still want to believe in, in, in the system. That's correct. And we still want to uh, assure that patients get the services that they need, uh, and we would like to continue to have a continued dialogue with both the state as well as these private companies uh, who manage the Medicaid program. That's you know, I need to call the names. We are available to talk about it, but we are very distraught and very disturbed about the, the services that have been available so far. Literally, because again, there are consequences to poor health, not just for the individual, and I always say there's a moral imperative, even if it didn't affect, affect the greater community, if, you know, health should be a right. And uh, uh, even if it affect one, affected one individual, we should make sure that one individual has proper, adequate health care. There's a minimal level uh, that the United Nations demands. Uh, it's not even an American issue, and, and this country is still a great country. And uh, uh, cut back in other areas, but, you know, uh, uh, health should be primary. Health care uh, should be primary, and it should be a right and not a privilege. And certainly the country has, uh, have, has had this dialogue uh, for some time, and, and uh, certainly that's what the Accountable Care Act, uh, which is... Um, certainly in the spotlight uh, more and more every day and particularly at this time in terms of what's going on with uh, with Congress right. the position that they have apparently taken even today even as we speak about uh, delaying the onset of the uh, the uh, patient portable patient uh, protection uh, accountable care act 
uh, we think is, is, uh, is uh, really uh, very unfortunate, it's unfathomable, uh, it's disgraceful, uh, and we think that, that patients, that people need to be up in arms about that. You know, it's very ironic because patients in, this, in the state of Louisiana and the city of New Orleans, ultimately we used to be able to go to Charity Hospital. Well, Charity Hospital is not there. But, but these patients now are going into the, the private hospitals and so forth, and ultimately they get the care that they, uh, that they need, ultimately, even though it may be delayed care and okay. even though it may be emergent care, but who pays for that? Ultimately, uh, the private insurance companies pay for it in terms of the, of the add-on that they give to the patients who have private commercial policies. Uh, the, uh, the state, the taxpayers pay for that. So what that means is patients are going to get the patient care, so why not have a system in place that takes care of that in the first place so that patients don't have to go through uh, hoops and patients don't have to go through ex extra steps to get the care that they need. Hey, why not take care of the patient when the blood sugar is starting to rise as opposed to paying for the amputation and everything else? It's far, more, it's far less expensive to do a colonoscopy on the front end, no puns intended, right. than to end up with metastatic cancer on the back end where patients have to have surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, simply because they may not have had a simple uh, routine medical examination. Same thing for uh, certainly in terms of women's health care, in terms of the mammograms, in terms That's of correct. the pap smears. That's These correct. things should be, uh, should be, everyone should have the right to that. On the front, on ultimately what it means is not only a healthy community, but also it would be a, a less expense to the community and it be for the good, it should be for the common good. That's right, and, um, and, and I'll say directly, the decision by the governor and whatever legislators that are supporting him and, and, not, ex, and, and not allowing the uh, uh, Obamacare or whatever to uh, be used in Louisiana uh, has to be one of the worst decisions I've ever seen in the history of this country. Uh, you know, I'll say that up front, that it, how can it be with a country that is at the bottom uh, to say that we're not going to receive federal money uh, that other states uh, are receiving? It, it, this is, I haven't seen anything worse than that. Yeah, I think, you, I think you're quite correct. And, of course, you know the various segment uh, particularly have an impact upon Louisiana in terms of the expansion, the three major components, the expansion of the uh, Medicaid system to involve more patients who uh, don't have health care. Right. Uh, for that to be eliminated was uh, certainly uh, very, very ridiculous. Uh, not to allow, uh, uh, not to participate in the creation of the uh, insurances that would be available. Uh, that was another component uh, that was available to the state. And of course, more, more recently, where the, uh, where the pay uh, would increase 6% from 62 to 68% of the federal contribution uh, to patients or to the Medicaid patients uh, for patients who needed expanded medical care, for instance, the patients who are, are disabled. Uh, this, this particular money would be available so that they would not have to go into nursing home and institutionalization, okay, mm -hmm. and would be paid uh, to home health cares uh, for the patient, for the care of those patients. Uh, so what it means is no, one number two thing, one or two things, is that that the nursing homes now uh, now still have those patients, which is very expensive for the state. Extreme, much more expensive. Extreme. Or what it means is that those patients are do, doing without those services, all of which have consequences. So, th so the three major components of the Accountable Care Act, which for this particular state. Uh, should be more important for this state than probably any other since we're on the, on the end of the spectrum and so far as, as health care in the United States. We should be standing in line. We should have been the first uh, state, in my opinion. Uh, now, of course, this is not a perfect act and there are some deficiencies, 
Oh, and true. certainly some of, but true. but some of the arguments I think which have been advanced, for instance, the last component we're talking about, that that there would be some suits that would arise because some people would not be covered, uh, to me it does not hold water, or uh, that uh, that it would increase the overall expense uh, to the state, whereas in fact if you look at it, just the lack of medical care increases the expense to the state. So I think that we have to understand uh, when these positions are taken, they may not be what they seem and so far as the arguments that are advanced, that there may be some secondary motives uh, to people taking those positions um, and ultimately the people suffer. Well, I think that ends up being the bottom line is that what will affect patient care and, and any option that allows a huge portion of the population in Louisiana to go without medical care is just unacceptable. I mean, so if they have a better plan, bring it in. But until the, a better plan can be created and set up, there's just no way to deny it. Uh, let's bring it around to another point before we um, close out. There's, we've had physicians that have been serving the poor in the city pre-Katrina, post-Katrina. For a period of time, right after Katrina, uh, it was a hundred million dollar influx of money and then it was reset and they found more money or whatever and uh, you know we pushed it on this program also uh, about the medical home initiatives well uh, that money has come in to create medical homes but you still have physicians that work day in and day out in a community that that can accept a whole lot of patients that can accept a ton of patients so we have this money bringing in medical homes and granted a great job but uh, all are we talking to the physicians that are working right in the community, the pharmacists that are working right in the community? Yes, I write, I have a vested interest as a pharmacist, so I'll put that out on the table. Um, that uh, are we using federal dollars to suck away money um, or opportunities from physicians, pharmacists, or whatever that, are, that have been here and have, have always been here? Yeah, I think that's a, a point that's well taken. Uh, 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 certainly, I think that the concept, here again, concept and reality are two different things, but the concept of medical home is, is, is uh, uh, at its face value, uh, seems to be very enticing. Uh, and certainly in terms of the monies that have been put into the system uh, to support these kinds of operation, I think is, is good. There certainly was a void there in terms of of availability and accessibility of medical care, a lack thereof. Uh, <clears throat> however, as you mentioned, uh, there are those of us who have been in the community for a long time, who have been dedicated and committed to serving the needs of our community. Uh, for instance, I think I mentioned to you that uh, I, was, I was very pleased that I had a patient who, who returned to my office who I had not seen mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of years uh, I came to my, back to my office last week and she said, I went to this clinic, same mm -hmm. home health, so the, the medical home that you're speaking of, and it was very nice. Uh, it was nicely um, uh, apportioned, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, I enjoyed it very much, but, but you have that personal touch and you're committed to me and I'm coming back to you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Chris Sylvain, Health Issues. Let's fight as hard as we can. Listen, operate, function, fight. Thank you.